This is Dr. Mubin Sayed. Today we're going to talk about the tinea solium or the brain worm or bladder worm or the pork tapeworm. The tinea solium is interesting and a creepy pathogen or a parasite. What I would like you to keep three things in your mind. Number one, the tapeworm itself, the adult tapeworm. Number two, a structure called cysti circus. Cysti from cyst and circus is a circus, <laughs> not the actual circus, but that is the term here, cysti circus. And the third one I would request you to keep in mind is oncosphere. The difference between them, if I can just foreshadow that for you so that when it comes across in our discussion, you can quickly grab it. The adult tapeworm, three to seven meter long, living in our intestine, that is the adult flat tapeworm. The oncosphere is the tiny little embryonic egg. That means it is fertilized egg with the tiny little head and some part of the neck of this parasite. Just little head and little neck. From there it would grow into a full uh, tapeworm afterwards, which is creepy that it just has the head and neck. And then the Christi circus is this head and neck, this head and neck living in a muscle or brain or spinal cord or liver or other tissues of a host in a bladder of fluids in a cavity filled with fluid and in that this head and neck is just sitting there waiting for it to be eaten by someone and then get its chance to become a tapeworm. So keep these three things in mind and let's start our discussion. What we are going to talk about is what is the flat tapeworm or pork tapeworm, um, the life cycle of it, the type of hosts, the type of structures I've already discussed, then the uh, clinical presentation, the diseases it causes, diagnosis and management. So with that, let's very quickly show you the references. So this is drbean.com. You might actually be watching this one on drbean.com. If not, <laughs> you should go get access to it. This is CDC about the cysticercosis. This is also CDC about the same one. One more reference. Then this is Mayo Clinic for the management of cysticercosis. This is Teniasis and WHO for the management. This is Teniasis, Oncosophias, scanning electron microscopy of this pathogen, and then the definition of Oncosophia and cysticercosis. So now we would start discussing with my diagrams. You will not see me now, but you would see the diagrams and the discussion. So here we're talking about tinea solium or pork tapeworm or bladder worm or brain worm. These are all the references that are made to it. So the two categories of diseases. This pathogen can cause two types of diseases based on its own maturity. The adult worm, tinea solium, causes teniasis. It lives in the intestine, upper intestine of its host, for example, humans or even pigs, and that disease is called teniasis. On the other hand, when it has its own little larval stage, when it is um, kind of uh, embryonic egg, fertilized egg stage, then it can infect the host and do uh, or produce cysticercosis or, uh, or uh, small tiny bladders of uh, containing the worms. We'll discuss that. But look at the structure over here. This is important. This is an oncosphere structure. This is, imagine that this worm has become fertilized. Egg, the sperm and the egg has fused and now the worm is forming. So what do we have? This internal structure here, this is actually the worm. And what it has is just a tiny mouth area or head area, which has these six little hooks in it. And it will form some suckers here too. And then 
a tiny neck and that's about it just the head and neck and even head is not mature head usually have a lot more hooks than six so this one only has six hooks then you also see these little bladders in here or these little pouches in here they contain enzymes that this little creature this little worm's head will use to break our intestinal wall to penetrate that and get into our tissues or pig's tissues so this is the actual head and neck of the pathogen parasite then it is covered in multiple layers so all of these layers together are called oncosphere so please do not forget this one we'll t discuss more now it has two kinds of hosts this parasite one is the intermediate host intermediate host will be the one where the parasite is present in its immature form so if i go back here for a second this oncosphere when it will enter a host and it could enter a pig which is the normal most usual case it could enter a human being as well and i'll discuss how when it enters a host and then goes to its tissues and starts living there in that tiny immature state then that host will be called an intermediate host on the other hand when a host so look at this person he's eating uh, less cooked pork for example and in this meat there is this um, cysty circus present here this little blue thing over here and that is that immature parasitic form of the tapeworm when that is eaten now this tapeworm is going to bind to the intestine of this person and start becoming into an adult worm so this is a definitive host a definitive host is a host where the parasite would grow into an adult stage now it is not necessary that it is a human being a pig can be a definitive horse as well a uh, host as well however in the case of pig tapeworm or tinea solium more commonly the definitive host is human being and more commonly the definitive intermediate host is pig now the structure of this uh, parasite this worm so as i said before in its larval stage or early life it is really just a little head and neck the head area is called scolex and the scolex has um, this area over here which makes which has a lot of hooks on it and then it has these suckers on it now think about it for a second ignore the whole big worm here just think about when it is head and neck what is the biggest need this pathogen has when it is only in the head and neck stage what it would like to do is it would like to go and sit down somewhere and wait for it to go into the intestine and live there so it needs to be able to burrow through the tissues it needs to be able to tunnel through the tissues so these hooks over here are made for it so that it can bite and tunnel through the tissues and and burrow and go and live within the muscle or the brain or liver etc the suckers on the other end are less useful in its early stage suckers will be useful once this parasite enters the intestine this head and neck this little part enters the intestine remember the oncosphere contains it and then it's going to go and live in the intestine then it is the suckers that would adhere it that would bind with the intestinal cellular villi and bind this pathogen there and then it would start absorbing the nutrients and start growing the remaining body this whole body together all of these things are called strobiliums so strobilation will occur once the head and neck have become bound to the host's intestine now in the body as you can see it is a segmented structure 
so right in the beginning where the neck is neck is mostly a segmented there is not much segments there but as the neck starts growing there would be tiny little segments that would appear those segments would then grow and as they are growing more tiny little segments will be formed and so the segment would continue to move distally and away and away now as these segments or these are also called proglottids as these proglottids start maturing can you imagine that they develop a complete reproductive system in them these all of them here i made this only in one but all of them have a uterus a vagina a sex pore testis these two are testis and ovaries so this proglotted every one of them can actually fertilize itself because it has testis and ovary both but there can be cross fertilization as well because there is vagina and sex pore as well so the um, sperms can be received from the other proglottids as well when this proglottid gets broken off from this worm usually if it has become gravid that means if it has become pregnant there can be up to 50000 embryonic eggs in it that is eggs that are fertilized now it is possible that those eggs are shed separately or they are within the proglottid both are possible the proglottid can come out containing the eggs in it or some proglottids would rup rupture and the eggs would actually come out of them now the shape of the egg once again if i go back here this is the shape of the egg in or the structure of the egg in the center of that egg is the little pathogen's head and neck only and even the head is immature only six teeth <laughs> hooks and then just tiny bit of these pouches and then coverings around this so this is the oncosphere that is the egg so here when you see these little red structures these are the oncospheres and if you look at the proglottid and those 50 thousand embryonic eggs these are also the oncospheres in this now what happens in the definitive host so what happens is the cysti cerci are ingested by the definitive host and this one sentence may not make enough sense yet because we haven't talked about where are the cysti cerci we haven't talked about where the meat why the meat contains it but if you go with me for a second let's say that this person is eating pork meat and in that pork meat there are the larval forms or early stages of the parasite sitting in the pork meat and the pork meat was not cooked well so the the parasite survived in there and this host has ingested that parasite so remember that parasite is not oncosphere but but the next stage from the oncosphere which is called cysti cercus so cysti cerci are present in the meat and they are now ingested by this human being once those cysti cerci enter this person's intestine over there they will become everted and they would reveal that head and neck from within and that head and neck would now bind with the intestinal cells in the upper intestinal cells remember that that head and neck area this area had six of those uh, hooks to it so those hooks can be used to attach but it is really the suckers that are the one that would act as a vacuum cup with which the pathogen's head will bind to the uh, villi of the cells once it is bound it is going to start absorbing the nutrition and start growing and that would be the strobulation or body will start forming the body contains multiple proglottids of those little structures in 10 to 12 weeks an adult worm is formed this is also why one even when somebody is infected with before couple of months you cannot easily find if they are infected or not 
Now it can live in human beings for two to five years. I read somewhere in the literature that even up to 25 years, but most of the literature says within two to five years. The gravid, now once it has started living in this human being or in this host, then same thing as I said before, those gravid proglottids and the oncosphere eggs will start getting shed in the stools of this person. Now, it is also possible that this person would have an anal area that will become itchy and this person might actually itch that area and then if they don't wash their hands and touch their mouth, they might self-infect or auto-infect themselves with the younger form of the tapeworm. They already have in their intestine the adult form and now they are infecting themselves with the eggs which are the younger form. So they might end up getting both infections both type of infections. Now, staying with the original pathway, the person is now infected with the adult tapeworm. This is called teniasis. The person's stool now has the oncospheres on it or proglottids containing the oncospheres. Now, imagine that a secondary host or intermediate host, let's say pig, is eating in the area of the contaminated, um, you know, surfaces which are contaminated by this human's fecal matter and now these oncospheres are going to enter this animal's uh, intestine. So here we are within the intestine of this pig for example and here is the oncosphere. What happens is that the outer structure of the oncosphere is broken down by our digestive enzymes and what happens is this little animal, the parasite, I'm calling it animal, this little parasite with the head and neck only and head even is the baby head, immature head, those are released. And once those are released, as I said before, they would use their hooks to start burrowing through the the intestinal wall. They would kind of tunnel through the intestinal wall, get back onto the internal side, get swept away either in the blood or the lymphatic system and now they would start circulating in our cir circulation in our body. Now they would figure out some tissue, for example, a majority of them will be killed in the liver. But some of them can actually make a, a place within the liver. Others would go to pigs uh, muscles. Some of them can actually enter the brain or spinal cord and start living there as well. So, when they enter a tissue, then they convert, this pathogen converts into another form which is called cysticercus. Here if you see there is a bladder like fluid filled cavity and within that cavity, there is an inverted, that is inverted inside, the head and the neck of the pathogen. And head has those little hooks on it and suckers on it. And this is the neck. And now it is within this bladder or cyst. This cyst can now live in the brain, in the eyes, muscles, livers, and other tissues as well, spinal cord, etc. Now I want to clarify something over here. Uh, recently there was news of the um, brain eating worm. This worm actually does not eat brain. That is called neurocysticercosis or cysticercosis. It does not eat the brain. It actually enters the brain tissue just like any other tissue where it will enter and form a cyst around that and start living in that cyst. At some point it is going to die, about 5 to 10 years later. It grows very slowly and forms a cyst around it and then 5-10 years later it would die. When it will die, the bladder would break and when the bladder would break, that would release the fluids from the bladder into the local vicinity and the antigenic properties of the fluid would cause local inflammation and that can cause a lot of symptoms. Now when the bladder is being formed and grow, that can also cause symptoms too. We'll go to that in a second. But I just wanted to clarify over here that the 
this worm is not going to sit in the brain and start eating the brain tissue. Now, imagine that this was pig who had these, uh, who had ingested these eggs and now these eggs are living in its muscles or its liver or its eyes or brain. Imagine they were in the muscle and now a human being is it eating pork meat but it is not well cooked. When it is not well cooked, it may have the cysticercus in it or cercae, meaning many of them. When that human will eat this, now the human is getting infected by the eggs. So what would happen is when the person becomes infected by the eggs, then the same um, pathway as we discussed before, they would eat the eggs, they would, these eggs would come in, they would then, um, the head that is in there would bind with the intestinal cells and it would become a tapeworm and now we have teniasis. So you can see that the human is getting teniasis and the pig is getting cysti cerci. Now sometimes this can go the other way as well. And that is that human might end up eating the oncospheres because of the contaminated hands by their own anal area or by another person. Imagine that another person in the family has tapeworm and they are not very clean or hygienic with their hands. So they went to the restroom, they touched the uh, poop or somehow they became contaminated. Now they touched other places and someone else within the family touched that place or fomite as we call it and then they touched their mouth or it ended up on the food and from the food it went into their mouth. Now they're eating oncospheres. Now they're going to act as an intermediate host. Now this oncosphere is going to get into their intestine over there. As I said before, this oncosphere would break down by the digestive enzymes. The parasite would come out the little head and neck of it, it would burrow through the intestinal cells and then it would go to this human's brain or liver or spinal cord or muscles and it is going to go and live there. So if it is living in the muscles or liver, most of the time there are not much symptoms because it doesn't grow there, it is just a little head and a neck. But if it goes to the brain, then neurocysti circus would occur and that pressure that would develop in this uh, bladder would cause symptoms. So what are those symptoms? Clinical presentation. So first, teniasis. Teniasis is when the tapeworm is present in the intestine. There may be no symptoms or slowly there may be generalized symptoms that you may not be able to exactly say that this is because of the tapeworm. Abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea, constipation, and that would happen if it happens after a couple of months because the uh, when the infection occurs it's only a tiny head and neck and they have to now take about 10 weeks to grow into a mature uh, three to seven meter long worm and that is when the symptoms may appear and people could have symptoms for years and not know that this is tapeworm now the clinical presentation of cysticercosis and especially neurocysticercosis that is in the brain. It is now, so CDC says, it is now recognized that most infections are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic and benign. However, it is possible that headache, dizziness, epilepsy and seizures might occur. Actually in the developing world, the most common cause of acquired seizures meaning they were not present at the time of birth or didn't have a congenital reason for that. Acquired seizures, most common cause is tapeworm. The leading cause of seizures worldwide, dementia and hypertension due to cerebrospinal fluid circulation issues. So imagine that there is a tiny bladder that is developing, a cyst that, that is developing in the brain. It could actually disrupt the channels through which the cere cerebrospinal fluid is moving and that pressure and disruption to the CSF could cause dementia and hypertension. Why hypertension? What happens is that when the CSF level, the pressures increase, the brain orders the remaining body's vascular system 
to increase the blood pressure as well so that the brain can continue to have the circulation and brain thinks that if my pressure is higher then the body's pressure has to be higher than that so that it can pump the flu the the blood to me so as the intracranial pressure increases the systemic pressure increases too so hypertension develops sensory deficit could occur if the um, the cyst that is forming that is near sensory systems or sensory pathways then the sensory deficit can occur involuntary movements can occur if the cyst is near the motor systems focal deficits can appear blindness can appear so it depends where the cyst is and wherever that is in the brain um, the symptoms would appear related to that area Usually 7 to 10 cysts grow slowly for 5 to 10 years and then begin to die. Fluid leaks causing local inflammation which can actually exaggerate these symptoms. Now diagnosis of cysticercosis. And I think the spelling I should be here. So CT scan, this is according to CDC and today is uh, May 9, 2024. These might change later on, but this is what is there today. CT is superior to MRI for small calcifications to identify that there are calcifications of those dead uh, cysti cerci. On the other hand, MRI shows cyst in some location better than CT. MRI is more sensitive than CT to demonstrate surrounding edema, might show changes indicating death of cysti cerci as well. CDC prefers immunoblot due to its sensitivity and specificity is well characterized in literature. Stool tests may be done, high specificity, low sensitivity, stool tapeworm antigen detection, stool PCR, serum antibody tests can be done as well. Now please remember that there are many kinds of tapeworms and uh, they might all make the uh, stool test positive so uh, differentiating between them becomes a problem. Management and I have deliberately directly placed the management from CDC and WHO over here. We might have a different management in the future. Again this is 5-9-2024. I refer directly to these sites so that we know the up to date and in protocol management by these organizations. So here, what medication and procedures are used to treat cyst cysticercosis? And so corticosteroids. So think about it with me. Why corticosteroids? Why steroids? The reason is that when you are going to give medication that is going to disrupt the cysticerci or these bladders, when they burst, when the worm dies in there and they burst open, they would cause local inflammation and that inflammation can become, in if there are many neurocysticerci, it could become life-threatening. CDC site says it could become life-threatening. If that is the case, we have to give steroid to control the inflammation. So corticosteroids, prednisolone, dexamethasone to reduce inflammation, anti-epileptic and anti-convulsant medica medications, phenytoin, scurvy, carbamazepines once again why because when you are going to start treating the, the the pathogen and when it is dying there could be irritation of the neurological tissue causing more seizures and epilepsy attacks so you, you may have to give that those drugs antiparasitic medications albendazole praziquantel are sometimes used to treat the infection surgery to remove cysts or to put in a tube shunt to redirect the fluid in your brain is possible as well so this was the cleveland clinic now who in neurocysticercosis since the destruction of cysts may lead to an inflammatory response specialized treatment is required and may include long courses with high doses of praziquantel or albendazole as well as supporting therapy with corticosteroid and and, and or antileptic drugs anti-epileptic drugs and possible possible surgery the dosage and the duration of treatment can vary vary greatly and depend mainly on the number size location and developmental stage of the cyst their surrounding inflammation inflammatory edema acuteness and severity of clinical symptoms etc and then they say look at our um, page for more now this is the management of teniasis. 
to assist in controlling this WHO to assist in controlling or stopping the parasite transmission cycle the treatment can be done on an individual basis or as preventive chemotherapy depending on the local circumstances TNESs can be treated with single doses of praziquantel 10 mg per kilogram or nicolosamide adults and children over 6 years 2 g children aged 2 to 6 years 1 g albendazole at 400 mg for 3 consecutive days has also been used recommendations and important considerations for the use of these drugs for preventive chemotherapy are described in their separate page then is th- this is the discussion then is the prevention so there has been vaccines for um, for livestock but hand washing and hygiene is a very very important thing so this is the discussion at the end i'm going to put you through one more um repetition a person who has adult tapeworm will have tenesis if they touch somehow their anal area and in there there are gravid proglottids and or eggs which are fertilized and then they end up touching food or something and then they end up eating that food for example and the eggs are ingested now the oncospheres are going to get in which would then become freed and then they would go through the intestinal wall and live in the brain or the liver or the muscles and now this person has cysty cirrhosis plus tenesis both and uh, i heard one very famous doctor a couple of days ago talking about somebody's um, uh, condition of brain worm and said they must have eaten uh, undercooked meat pork meat undercooked pork meat will bring in cysty cirrhi cysty cirrhi when are ingested they will bind to the intestinal wall and become tapeworm cysty cirrhi when ingested will not make cysty cirrhi in the body so if somebody had neurocysty cirrhi that must be because they ingested eggs their own or from somebody else not because they ate raw meat raw meat will cause tapeworm infection or tenesis not cysty cirrhi after 2 3 months auto infection may then result in cysty cirrhi with this thank you very much and i would see you the next time bye for now